All right, let's look at the software used to control the motor. Let's begin with the initializations. We're going to use port A for the output, so I'll activate its clock. We have two global variables, H and L, and they are going to be initialized to some value. This value doesn't matter, but they're initialized. Uh, we're going to turn on port A, uh, bit 5, in the usual way. No analog, direction registers, and output. I am going to set the 8 milliamp uh, output current because this has to drive the base of the TIP120. So I'll enable 8 milliamps out of PA5, uh, and I'll enable it and then initially make PA5 low. I want to run Cystic, so I'm going to set the reload value equal to L, and so it will run for uh, this initial value, uh, 8,000. Um, and writing a zero to the current will cause the counter to clear. In order to use interrupts, I need to set the priority. And so in priority three register, uh, these eight bits, or specifically the top three bits of this register, will specify the priority of the cystic interrupt, which I'm going to set to two. This is interesting because priority matters because I have two interrupts running. But I'm going to set it equal to two. And then to turn on cystic interrupts, I'm going to set the interrupt enable bit the clock source bit to 1 and the turn on the cystic to 1. That's a 7 in the control register. So now my uh, system is initialized. Next, let's initialize the two buttons, switch 1 and switch 2, in port F. Again, we're going to turn on the clock for port F and wait for the clock to stabilize. Uh, since we're using PF0, we have to unlock it. So we write this value to the unlock red to the lock register, and then we can commit and allow us to write to those, uh, those bits. This stuff in the middle is the usual stuff we've been doing over and over again. PF4 and 0 are inputs. Uh, they're configured as general purpose I.O., no analog. They do have a pull-up because there's no pull-up on the board, so we have software pull-ups or internal pull-ups in the chip. Now comes the interesting part, and that is to set up an edge trigger and interrupt, we need to specify uh, it's edge sensitive as opposed to level sensitive, and that's by clearing the bits in the I.S. register so it's edge sensitive and not level. We have to specify the edge by setting these two registers. IBE is not both, but it is falling edge. So we're going to zero the corresponding bits, bit 4 and bit 0, for all three of these. So it will be falling edge, edge triggered interrupt on port F. I like to clear the flags in the ritual, so the first interrupt occurs after I'm all done. So when you write to the IC register, that'll clear the flags. They probably weren't set, but I'm a little worried about that sort of thing. We do want to arm it, and again, all of these bits could have caused an interrupt, but in this case, we're only going to interrupt on bits 4 and bit 0 from the two switches. I mentioned priority with cystic. I'm going to mention priority again and set the edge triggered interrupt on port F also to priority 2. Because I'm going to share two global variables, H and L, I need to make sure that they're always in a consistent state. So if this interrupt is priority 2 and the other one's interrupt is priority 2, those two interrupts will never suspend each other. They are equal brothers in the priority scheme. So one will not interrupt the other. So H and L will always be consistent. Now the edge triggered interrupt uh, is an external device, so we need to enable it in the nested vector interrupt controller, and that's here in register um, EN0. Uh, this bit is interrupt 30, which is that um, edge triggered interrupt on port F. You notice I have not enabled interrupts yet. 
Where do I do that? Let's look in the main program. One of the good design practices is to go through the initialization process with interrupts disabled. That means no interrupts can happen. Set the bus clock to 80, set the uh, cystic interrupts to be on, output enable PA5, arm and enable the PF4 and PF0 falling edge interrupts. And then after the entire system is completely enabled, initialized, then I will enable interrupts. So the first interrupt has to occur after all the initializations. So I'm not getting interrupts before I've initialized. The other interesting thing to observe in the main program, and that is this entire robot controller is going to occur in the software. So all the software to control the robot occurred in the two interrupt service routines, which we'll look at in a moment. But the main program is free to do other things. And as grandma said, when you leave the room, turn off the lights. So if there's nothing else to do, this will actually enter a low power wait state for those interrupts to occur. All right, let's look at the interrupts. Let's look at the cystic interrupt service routine. Again, this occurs twice every millisecond. If the signal on PA5 is equal to a one, this will be true and we will then set it equal to a zero. We'll clear PA5 and then we're going to run for the following L minus one cycles with PA5 low by setting the reload value to L minus one. Well if uh, if PA5 wasn't equal to a 1, it had to have been equal to a 0. That's the else. And so in that case, what we'll do is we'll turn PA5 on, and then we will leave PA5 on for H minus 1 bus cycles. So in this way, we have PA5, which is high for H cycles and low for L cycles. And this whole time here is going to be one millisecond. All right, let's look at the other interrupt service routine. Okay, let's look at the interrupt service routine. We saw that this could occur on the falling edge of either switch one or switch two. And the raw interrupt status register will let me know which one occurred. So if the raw interrupt status bit zero is set, we know that switch two was the one that was touched. And so what we're gonna do is if there's room, if the L is big enough, we will then decrease L. Uh, decreasing L will cause it to speed up. And then after we looked at switch two, we'll look at switch one. Again, the raw interrupt status bit 4 will tell us if switch 1 was pressed. And if switch 1 is pressed, and if L is small enough, we'll make L bigger. Making L bigger, as we saw, will cause it to slow down. And then in all cases, we will force H plus L to be equal to 80,000. 